Hey, everyone. I'm Matt with the Web Developer Relations team. I'm here to talk to you about progressive web apps and how tools and libraries can make building them easier. Progressive web apps are the latest buzzword craze in web development. Progressive web apps are cool, and they use all of the latest exciting technologies. And that's probably enough to get quite a lot of developers interested. But far more importantly, building progressive web apps is about building web experiences that are useful, enjoyable, and accessible for your users. And I hope that's enough to impress the rest of you. Part of what makes progressive web apps possible now is a shift in the way that the web platform itself is built. In the old web, you got custom-designed, high-level features for achieving things that the W3C thought uh, web developers wanted to do. People want images, so you get an image tag. People want to lay things out in tables, so you get a table tag. The new idea in the web standards world is called the extensible web. And it says that instead of creating simple APIs for specific things, new features should be low level, deep, and powerful, enabling a much broader range of things. So rather than a tag for showing images, we get a tag for drawing arbitrary graphics. And rather than a tag for showing tables, we get CSS properties that allow us to lay stuff out however we want. This gives us the features we need to upgrade our app, uh, pages into apps. But we also have this gap now between the level we want to work at and what the platform gives us. And we can fill this gap with libraries. So in the extensible web, the community is given the responsibility of providing the simple, easy to use libraries for the specific things that developers want to do. This is great, because it's much quicker and easier to iterate on the API of a library than it is to iterate on the platform itself. And it also means that even as we speak, other people are out there solving hard problems so that you don't have to. So today, I'm going to talk about uh, some service worker libraries. I'm going to talk about Chrome DevTools and the progressive web app features that are being added there. And we're also going to talk about how tooling can help you understand, is my app a progressive web app? And is there anything else that I need to do? So the most important new technology, as far as progressive web apps are concerned, is service workers. Service workers are a background thread for your application, and they open up all sorts of new features uh, like offline, push messaging, and background data sync. For the offline use case, your service worker gets to act as a network proxy right in the client. Whenever your page requests any resource, be it an image, a script, or the HTML for the page itself, an event fires in the service worker that you get a chance to respond to. The service worker can then use the cache and fetch APIs to do something fancy, like serving up cached content. But it's not actually just about offline. Even being online doesn't mean that your uh, users will have a good time. You could have an incredibly slow connection. Maybe you're in a place where data is going to cost you a lot of money. Maybe you're trying to use the Wi-Fi in a Mountain View hotel room. You don't just want to work offline. What you want is connectivity independence. It's about making your app work well, regardless of the network situation. But of course, with complex apps is going to come complex service workers. There'll be a lot of code to implement some of these things that you want to do. And there are lots of new APIs to learn. So we have a library, Service Worker Toolbox. This was created by Google to abstract away some of the common patterns for connectivity independence. So let's run through a pretty simple example of a service worker that's written with Service Worker Toolbox. This is the full script. This is everything you'd need for this particular example site to go offline. So first of all, we import Service Worker Toolbox. And then we have this line, toolbox.precache. Now, when a service worker is installed, it gets a chance to act. And Service Worker Toolbox uses that opportunity to download resources that you've told it to with this pre-cache line and stick them in a cache so that those resources will always be available to your application uh, for the whole lifetime of the service worker. And you'd use this for things like the shell of your app, the resources that are shared across all your pages, uh, perhaps the resources needed to show your uh, home page experience. Or if your app is something that can work entirely offline, maybe your whole app goes here. As an important aside, uh, whenever the service worker changes, the install event happens again. So this pre-cache will happen every time you update your resources, as long as you change the service worker as well. So next up, toolbox.router.default equals toolbox.fastest. Now, toolbox.router is the part of the system that m handles matching parts of your site to the behavior that you want to have. So here we're using setting the default behavior. 
uh, and we're setting it to fastest, which I'll talk about in a moment. And then you can have different behavior for different parts of your site. So here we set, uh, use toolbox.router.get to say get requests for things beginning with slash API slash should use the network first uh, behavior. And we can pass in some options. And again, I'll talk about what network first is in a moment. So the methods we saw called fastest and network first are what we call strategies. Typically, you need to think carefully about which, what's the best strategy for each part of your site or for each uh, kind of resource on your site. SW Toolbox comes with five built-in strategies. So fastest, when a request comes in, we race both the cache and the network, and whichever one comes back first uh, delivers its result to the page. Now, obviously, if, you've, if the resource is already cached, it will probably be the cache that wins. But this way, you, uh, you will get the network if it's not already in the cache. Another useful feature is that when the network quest succeeds, if it succeeds, if you're online, it will update the version in the cache. So you're not quite up to date, because if you keep refreshing, you keep getting the last uh, version uh, rather than the current version. But this is good for stuff that's allowed to be slightly out of date uh, that you want to be returned very fast. On the flip side, though, this does always make the network request. So you are potentially costing the user money uh, using up their data plan. So as an alternative, you could use network first. <clears throat> this one, you would try the network. And only if that fails do we go to the cache and return the response. Again, if the network succeeds, this will update the cache. Um, but because it goes to the network first, it means that when you are online, you get that latest resource. So this is good for stuff that should be fresh if you can get it, uh, but that you still want to work offline. So for example, uh, your latest tweets or the emails in your inbox. You want to be able to reload the app and show whatever you had before when you're offline. <clears throat> and this one comes with an, uh, a pretty important option that I want to highlight. So network timeout on a mobile device can be two minutes. So if you request a resource using the network first strategy, and your device thinks it has a connection, but really it's never going to get anything, your users could be waiting two minutes for that to time out. So we allow you to set a different network timeout. And if that amount of time here, five seconds, elapses, we just give up and return from the cache anyway. Any time that your users are waiting for a resource to download, you should probably do this, and your users will thank you. Cache first, uh, sort of the opposite of network first. This will go to the cache, and only if that fails will it try the network. Again, if, if it does go to the network uh, and it succeeds, it will update the cache. But because it's always going to the cache first, it means that once it has succeeded once and put it into the cache, it will always use that old version. So this is uh, good in some ways. You're not going to the network. You're not even trying the network if it's something you've already got in the cache. But it will always be stale after that first time. So this is good for resources that never change, um, but that aren't part of your shell, so you don't want to pre-cache them. So imagine in the case of a uh, a blog. If you have 10 years worth of articles, you don't want, as soon as the, uh, any user lands on your page, to download all 10 years worth of your articles. Um, but you do want, if someone's going backwards and forwards, to just use the version in the cache. Um, <clears throat> obviously, a trick here would be to version the URL of your articles so that if you do want to make a change in the future, users will still get it. Uh, now, cache only is slightly yes, less useful. But uh, this is handy for the stuff that you've pre-cached. Because a request comes in, we go to the cache, and if it fails, that's it. That's all we do. It never tries the network. So if, you, if it's something you've pre-cached, or something where uh, you, perhaps you, can up, you have some other way of updating the cache, this is a, a good way of saying, don't even try the network. I only want to show cached stuff. And then network only, which is the flip only go to the network, and if it fails, it fails. This is basically like not having 
a behavior set for a particular route with your router. But if you've set a default, this can allow you to override it to get back to that uh, original default behavior. Now, if that doesn't give you the control that you want, you can create your own uh, strategies. So here I've uh, created a function. This code is more or less lifted from this year's I.O. website. Um, so <clears throat> we show profile images for speakers in the I.O. website. And we don't want to download hundreds and hundreds of uh, small images and fill the device straight away. Uh, so what we do is, if you're offline, the, uh, well, it, when we try and fetch the, those uh, images, we try and fetch it from the network. And if it fails, we just return uh, a fallback image from the cache. So obviously here, we need to make sure that we pre-cached the fallback image, so that it's actually, actually available when we request it. And then we set up a route that actually uses this strategy. And you can also get fine control over the cache. So here, we've set up a route for uh, posts. This could be blog articles. This could be uh, Google Plus posts, something like that. And you want to be able to cache them. You want people to go to the things that they've looked at recently and get them again. But you don't want to just endlessly fill the device as they browse around. So we can set a maximum number of entries, in this case 500, and a maximum number of seconds that those uh, should be available. So I've set this to five days. But even with all this control, the pre-caching part can be tricky. You need to make sure that the service worker changes in order to get a new one installed. And if you've got lots of assets in your site, it can be tricky to know exactly uh, which things need to be pre-cached, uh, whether things have changed, and do I need to actually uh, send a new version. And the other thing is that service worker toolbox's pre-cache method, when that install event fires, it re-downloads everything. It has no way of knowing what might have changed on the server. So it re-downloads everything and sticks it into the cache fresh. So we have another tool called SW Precache that will help you solve these problems. Based on a few options, this will actually write a service worker for you. So you tell it which files you want to cache. It will take a hash of each of those files and include that data in the service worker it changes. And because it includes the hashes in the service worker, it means that any time a file actually changes, it updates the, uh, it causes a new install. But if you have the, exactly the same files and none of them have changed, it won't. This also means that during the install step, you can compare the hashes of the, uh, the files that are meant to be pre-cached by the service worker with the files you already have in the cache. So you only have to re-download things that have actually changed. Now, this can be used as a uh, CLI tool. You install it from NPM, uh, and you just run the SW pre-cache uh, command. Here, I've passed in an option to say which, uh, which folder is the root of my application and where to write the service worker. You can also use it as a node module. So here, we require in s precache, and we use the precache.write method. We say where the service worker should go and which files should be cached. Here, it's all of the HTML and CSS in the project. Now, that works great for the shell of your application, but aren't we losing the power of S3 Toolbox for dynamic resources like API requests? Well, as you see here, we can combine the two. The runtime caching option that we're passing to S3 Precache um, allows you to say what your S3 Toolbox rules should be. Uh, it uses the same patterns and maps to the same handlers. And S3 Precache will write out the code for your S3 Toolbox service worker into its, into its service worker. And if you want full control yourself, you can instead say to set S2 precache, I just want you to include some other file in the service worker. So you could write the, uh, the S2 toolbox rules manually for your dynamic content uh, and just tell S2 precache to load that as well. Now, service worker isn't supported everywhere, and app cache is. So, shouldn't we actually be using app cache? So app cache works, but I wouldn't use it for any new sites. <clears throat> app cache comes with a whole ton of problems. It has security flaws, which is why it's actually recently been restricted, been restricted to secure, and, uh, secure engines only. And you don't get any of the control that you get with Service Worker. 
there are actually a whole bunch of things that I've already just mentioned that are actually hard, if not impossible, to do with app cache. However, if you already have an app cache, we have a tool to help you with that. And this will help you transition from your app cache site to a service worker. So you import this library, and then you write a, uh, a fetch handler inside your service worker, and you just tell it that you want to use the legacy app cache behavior. What this will do is it will look into the page that you use to register the service worker and find its app cache manifest. And then it will just try and behave exactly like the app cache. But actually, it uh, gets around a few of the more gnarly problems with app cache. And app cache, uh, SW app cache behavior, which I failed to call out the name for, is actually just the first of many service worker helpers that we're releasing as part of our set of SW helpers. So and as, a, as an example of the sort of thing we've been working on, we have offline analytics. This was originally developed for last year's I.O. website and is used again this year. And it provides an SW Toolbox caching strategy function that handles failed requests to Google Analytics, queues those requests up, and then the next time the user is online, it sends them off. Uh, and it actually handles uh, putting a timestamp on those requests so that the requests are attributed to the correct time when the user actually made the action. So you can gather metrics from users who are offline. And we're going to be adding a whole bunch of more tools into this uh, repo over the next coming months. And now we move on to other tools. Uh, I just used the same transition. This one's not as exciting. So no talk about developer tools would be for the web would be complete without mentioning Chrome DevTools. And there are some great progressive web app features uh, coming in the latest Canary. So these features, most of it's only available in Chrome 52, which is, as I say, at the Canary stage. So the resources panel has been uh, renamed to application. Um, to better reflect that these are uh, things that web apps need rather than just the resources for your site. So here we have the manifest panel. Um, and it, <coughs> the, the web app manifest gives, you, uh, gives the system information about your app uh, for things that would be used outside of your page. So for example, icons to use on the home screen, the colors to set the UI for with the theme color, uh, and images to use in a splash screen. And this page gives you uh, a diagnostic of the manifest that it found and the values that were in there. Now, the manifest is an important part of the uh, add to home screen uh, process. So you'll get an add to home screen prompt for your app if you meet certain criteria, including having a manifest. And then to test that out, we added to this manifest screen is a new button add to home screen, uh, which doesn't actually add the app to your home screen, but it triggers the, uh, the on before install prompt uh, so that you can actually, uh, so the event, so you can trigger that prompt to test how things are working with your manifest. Then we have the redesigned service worker panel. <clears throat> the service worker panel that used to be here was pretty, uh, pretty cluttered with all sorts of things. So now uh, in the, you, you just see a list of uh, the service workers uh, along with their current state. You have the same, uh, same controls that you had before, uh, but just in a simplified view. But we also get these uh, cool new features uh, at the top. So the offline checkbox means that uh, it, sets the <clears throat> uh, it sets it so that whenever you make a a request from your page, it just n never goes to the network. It just assumes the network will fail uh, so that things always get handled by your service worker. Update on reload means that every time you refresh the page, it will run the service worker install event again, even if nothing has actually changed, so that you can test things with the install process for your service worker. And bypass for network, which means sort of the opposite of the offline case. It means that whenever a network request is made by your page, the service worker won't actually be asked to get involved. So this is helpful if you're testing something that would normally be cached in your service worker, but you want your old save refresh uh, workflow back. This is one of my favorite little features that's been added. It's the clear storage section. So obviously, in the main Chrome UI, you have the ability to clear private browsing data. But the controls you get are uh, pretty limited. First of all, it will clear things for every site that you have uh, browsing data for, uh, rather than just the current site. 
And you only get to control how far back you want to go. Here we have a more developer-oriented uh, system. So this allows you to say, for this current origin, I want to clear all these things. It will unregister, serve, unregister service workers, clear your index DB, and clear the cache storage, etc. And the last thing that I'd like to point out is the cache storage viewer. This has actually been in Chrome DevTools for a while, but a lot of people don't know about it. And this just lists, uh, for a given cache, uh, what's actually in there, which can be great for debugging your apps. So we've looked at a bunch of tools that will help you fulfill all of the progressive web app criteria. But how do you know if you're done? What would be cool is if there was just like a button you could click that would scan your site and tell you if you were missing something. So the Chrome team built one. And it's called Lighthouse. And they have a very cool professional looking logo. <coughs> engineer art at its finest. Um, so this works as a Chrome extension or uh, an NPM module. As a Chrome extension, you load up your page, you click the button, uh, and it will use the remote debugging API to gather all sorts of information about your page. So it'll reload your page a couple of times and then produce a report. It gives you a score of, uh, based on the progressive web app criteria uh, and tell you how you're doing. Uh, and at the end, it also gives you information on some best practices, things that we're not necessarily going to score, but things that you might want to check out. So do you have ARIA elements? Uh, do, uh, is your manifest set up correctly? The CLI tool does basically the same thing. Uh, you install this via NPM again, which I missed. And uh, you just tell it a URL to go to. It will load Chrome in the background, load up the, the site there, do all the, uh, uh, the refreshing. Uh, and it can output uh, either pretty print to the console, it can output JSON, which you can parse yourself, or it can output the same HTML that you saw in the, uh, uh, the extension report. And obviously, you, <coughs> oh, sorry. And you can also uh, include it as a, a node module. So you can require Lighthouse and tell it which site to go through, and then you get the results as a bundle of JSON. And using either this or the command line is how you can. <laughs> yes. Ohana is great. We should all check it out, but don't use it in the talks. <laughs> <laughs> At previous conferences, they've used that to signal that it was the end of your talk. And I was like, but I have 20 minutes left. Uh, <laughs> uh, so you can use this to uh, hook up the results into your tests or into your uh, continuous integration. Uh, now, I want to draw attention to the alpha in the corner here. This is pretty early stages. The rules aren't final. Um, and it only works in Canary. Uh, well, it, well, it works in Chrome 52 Plus, which is currently Canary. Uh, but you can check it out in GitHub. Uh, we encourage you to file issues or to contribute, if that's your thing. Uh, so we've talked about uh, the fact that progressive web apps are made possible by the extensible web. They're made practical by libraries and tools. Google has made a bunch of libraries for Service Worker, with more coming. Chrome DevTools is awesome, as always. And Lighthouse lets you know what you need to fix. So thank you very much. <laughs>